When asked how he could justify the treachery and deceit with which he had pursued the creation of the Standard Oil monopoly, John D. Rockefeller is reputed to have said, Competition is a sin. This is the mentality of the monopolist, and it is this justification, framed as religious conviction, that drove the oligarchs to so ruthlessly eliminate anyone who would dare rise up as a pretender to their throne. Ironically, it was the competition between the oligarchs in the early 20th century that helped give rise to an early external threat to their empire, alcohol fuel. As historian Lyle Cummins has noted of the period, the oil trust battles between Rockefeller, the Rothschilds, the Nobels, and Marcus Samuels Shell kept prices in a state of flux, and engines often had to be adaptable to the fuel that was available. In many areas where oil wasn't available, the alternative was alcohol. Ethyl alcohol had been used as fuel for lamps and engines since the early 19th century. Although it was generally more expensive, alcohol fuel offered a stability of supply that was alluring, especially in areas like London or Paris that did not have predictable access to oil supplies. Alcohol has a lower heat value, or BTU, than gasoline, but a series of tests by the U.S. Geological Survey and the U.S. Navy in 1907 and 1908 proved that the higher compression ratio of alcohol engines could perfectly offset the lower heat value, thus making alcohol and gasoline engines fuel economy equivalent. One early supporter of alcohol fuel was Henry Ford, who designed his Model T to run on either alcohol or gasoline. Sensing an opportunity for new markets to boost the independent American farms that he felt were vital to the nation, Henry Ford told the New York Times, The fuel of the future is going to come from fruit like that sumac out by the road, or from apples, weeds, sawdust, almost anything. There is fuel in every bit of vegetable matter that can be fermented. Farmers, looking to capitalize on this, lobbied for the repeal of a $2.08 per gallon alcohol tax that had been imposed to help pay for the Civil War. They were aided by those who saw fuel alcohol as a way to break the oligarch's monopoly. In support of a bill to repeal the alcohol tax, President Teddy Roosevelt told the U.S. Congress in 1906, the Standard Oil Company has, largely by unfair or unlawful methods, crushed out home competition. It is highly desirable that an element of competition should be introduced by the passage of some such law as that which has already passed the House, putting alcohol used in the arts and manufactures upon the free list. The alcohol tax was repealed in 1906, and for a time corn ethanol at 14 cents a gallon was cheaper than gasoline at 22 cents a gallon. The promise of cheap, unpatentable, unmonopolizable fuel production, production open to anyone with raw vegetable matter and a still, swept the nation. But cheap, plentiful fuel that can be grown and produced locally and independently is not what the oligarchs had in mind. A 1909 USGS report comparing gas and alcohol engines had noted that a significant point in alcohol fuel's favor was that there were fewer restrictions on alcohol engines. For the oligarchs, the answer was simple. Find a way to place greater restrictions on alcohol engines. Thankfully for them, the answer to their problem was already gaining popular support. In the 19th century, America had a drinking problem. By 1830, the average American over 15 years old drank 7 gallons of pure alcohol per year, three times higher than today's average. This led to the first anti-alcohol movements in the 1830s and 1840s, and the formation of the Prohibition Party in 1869, and the Women's Christian Temperance Union in the 1870s. The movement enjoyed widespread and growing support, but had few political successes. Maine flirted with Prohibition by outlawing the sale and manufacture of liquor in 1851, but the ban only lasted five years. This changed with the formation of the Anti-Saloon League in Standard Oil's birth state of Ohio in 1893. The ASL was started by John D. Rockefeller's longtime personal friend, Howard Hyde Russell, and was bankrolled in part by generous annual donations from Rockefeller himself. The ASL, with Rockefeller's backing, quickly became the driving force behind a national movement to outlaw the production and sale of alcohol. Rockefeller was a teetotaler himself, not from moral concern, but because he was afraid that good cheer among friends would lead to his downfall in business. Stephen Harkness, one of the silent partner investors in Standard Oil and a director in the company until his death, had caught Rockefeller's eye when he made a fortune buying up whiskey in advance of a new excise tax that he had been tipped about and selling it at a huge profit after the tax kicked in. No, 
Rockefeller and Standard Oil were not concerned about the moral state of the nation, except as far as it impacted their bottom line. But when Prohibition did come in 1920, it had an interesting side effect. Although it didn't ban the use of ethanol as a fuel directly, it did lead to increasingly burdensome restrictions, requiring producers to add petroleum products to their ethanol to make it poisonous before it could be sold. Alcohol fuel, now completely unable to compete with gasoline, was abandoned altogether by the automobile industry. Another existential threat to the vast fortunes of the early oligarchs was to require an even greater effort at social engineering. Public transportation. By the end of World War I, private car ownership was still a relative rarity. Only one in ten Americans owned a car. Rail was still the transportation of choice for the vast majority of the public, and city dwellers in most major cities relied on electric trolley networks to transport them around town. In 1936, General Motors formed a front company, National City Lines, along with Firestone Tire and Standard Oil of California, to implement a process of bustitution. Scrapping streetcars and tearing up railways to replace them with GM's own buses running on Standard Oil supplied diesel. The plan was remarkably successful. As historian and researcher F. William Engdahl notes in Myths, Lies, and Oil Wars, by the end of the 1940s, GM had bought and scrapped over 100 municipal electric transit systems in 45 cities and put gas-burning GM buses on the streets in their place. By 1955, almost 90% of the electric streetcar lines in the United States had been ripped out or otherwise eliminated. The cartel had been careful to hide their involvement in national city lines, but it was revealed to the public in 1946 by an enterprising retired naval lieutenant commander, Edwin J. Quimby, he wrote a manifesto exposing what he called a careful, deliberately planned campaign to swindle you out of your most important and valuable public utilities, your electric railway system. He uncovered the oligarch's stock ownership of national city lines and its subsidiaries, and detailed how they had step-by-step step bought up and destroyed the public transportation lines in Baltimore, Los Angeles, St. Louis, and other major urban centers. Quinby's warning caught the attention of federal prosecutors, and in 1947, National City Lines was indicted for conspiring to form a transportation monopoly and conspiring to monopolize sales of buses and supplies. In 1949, GM, Firestone, Standard Oil of California and their officers and corporate associates were convicted on the second count of conspiracy. The punishment for buying up and dismantling America's public transportation infrastructure? A $5,000 fine. H.C. Grossman, who had been the director of Pacific City Lines when it oversaw the scrapping of Los Angeles' $100 million Pacific Electric system, was fined exactly $1. Unsurprisingly, GM and its associates did not remain in the doghouse for long. In 1953, President Eisenhower appointed Charles Wilson, then the president of General Motors, as Secretary of Defense. Wilson, with Francis DuPont of the Rockefeller-connected DuPont family as Chief Administrator of Federal Highways, oversaw one of the largest public works projects in American history, the creation of the interstate highway system. With a war-era excise tax on train tickets still in place and federally funded highways and airports providing cheaper alternatives, rail travel declined a startling 84% between 1945 and 1964. This social engineering paid off well for Standard Oil and its growing list of petrochemical associates. In the two and a half decades after the outbreak of World War II, vehicle production in Detroit almost tripled, from 4.5 million cars a year in 1940 to over 11 million in 1965. As a result, sales of refined gasoline over the same period rose 300%. But Rockefeller was not the only oligarch working to crush all opposition to his monopoly. Across the pond, the European oligarchs were working to protect their own oil investments from upstart competitors. In 1889, a consortium of German investors led by Siemens Deutsche Bank obtained a concession from the Turkish government for extension of a railway line connecting Berlin to Basra on the Persian Gulf via Baghdad in what was then part of the Ottoman Empire. The Berlin-Baghdad railway concession was for 99 years and came with mineral rights for 20 kilometers on either side of the line, an especially lucrative deal since the rail cut right through the heart of the still untapped Mesopotamian oil region south of Mosul along the Tigris River. For the powers behind the British Empire, concerned with the military rise of Germany, this deal was unacceptable. Well, Germany 
in the end of the 19th century was looking for outlets for its exports, its industrial exports, as the German economy was growing like China is uh, growing in the last 30 years. And they decided that Turkey would be an ideal strategic trade partner for Germany. And Georg von Siemens, uh, one of the directors of Deutsche Bank, came up with a strategy to extend a railway from Berlin all the way down to Baghdad, which was then part of Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire, Baghdad and Iraq today, near the Persian Gulf. And German military began training the Turkish military. Uh, the German industry began investing in Turkey. They saw a huge potential market to begin bringing Turkey into the 20th century economically. Well, Deutsche Bank also negotiated mineral rights. I think it was 20 kilometers on either side of the railway. And it was already known in 1914 that Mosul and these other areas contained huge petroleum deposits. Well, why is that significant? At the end of the century, 19th century, Jack Fisher, the Lord of the Admiralty and, and the head of the Royal Navy, uh, advocated the conversion of the British Navy from coal-fired to oil-fired, that it would have a qualitative strategic improvement in their uh, every aspect of, of warship design. And since Britain didn't know that they had any oil back then, they went to Persia and swindled the Shah at that time out of uh, oil rights in Persia. They went to Kuwait and backed a coup d'etat of, of the al-Sabah uh, family to be a British pawn. And they literally wrote a contract with him that nothing that Kuwait does with the outside world will be done without approval of the British governor. And Kuwait was known to have oil and lying right on the Persian Gulf. Well, the British looked at this railway plan of the Germans going right down to Baghdad and said, my God, you can put soldiers on rail cars and bring them down and threaten the oil lifeline of the British Navy. This is a strategic uh, move by the Germans. It also would make Germany independent of the British control of the seas. The British oligarchs, including the British crown with its hidden controlling stake in Anglo-Persian oil and the Rothschilds merchant Marcus Samuel at Royal Dutch Shell, sought to counter this German threat to their commercial and strategic interests. They used Armenian-born, naturalized British citizen Kalust Golbekian, the architect of the Royal Dutch Shell merger, in order, as he later recalled, to see British influence get the upper hand in Turkey against the Germans. If that was his task, it was a remarkable success. In 1909, the British set up the Turkish National Bank, which was Turkish in name only. Founded by London banker Sir Edward Castle and with directors like Hugo Baring of the Baring's banking family, Castle himself, and Gulbenkian, the bank set up the Turkish Petroleum Company in 1912. Formed explicitly to exploit the petroleum-rich oil fields of Iraq, then part of the Ottoman Empire, Gulbenkian brokered a deal that forced Deutsche Bank, with its 40-kilometer concessions along the oil-rich Baghdad railway line, into a junior partnership in the company. The stock was split so the British government's Anglo-Persian oil company owned half the shares, with Royal Dutch Shell and Deutsche Bank splitting the other half. Their plan to take over Germany's Turkish oil interests had been successful, but in an amazing irony, it didn't even matter. Gulbenkian finished negotiations for the Iraqi oil concession on June 28, 1914, the same day Archduke Ferdinand was shot in Sarajevo. An alliance the British had been brokering for years to constrain the rising German threat, an alliance involving France and Russia, kicked into motion and the world was engulfed in war. By the end of World War I, the British and their allies had taken over Iraq and its oil deposits anyway, Germany had been completely cut out, and Gulbenkian, their scheming servant, received 5% of all oil field proceeds in the newly minted country. As the century wore on, the oil industry grew beyond the control of the handful of families that had dominated it since its inception. 
Oil deposits were located around the globe, and the resources of entire nation-states were marshaled to control them. Now, threats to the oligarchs and their interests required multilateral, multinational responses, and the consequences of those deals were felt worldwide. The story of the oil shock of 1973, as it has been delivered to us by the history books, is well known. By the late 1960s, the nation relied on imported oil to keep the economy strong. Then, in the early 1970s, oil-dependent America's nightmares came true. Thirteen oil-producing countries in the Middle East and South America formed OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. In 1973, OPEC placed an oil embargo on the U.S. and other nations that had supported Israel against the Arab states in the Yom Kippur War. The American economy went into a tailspin as gas shortages gripped the nation. Few, however, know that the crisis and its ensuing response was in fact prepared months ahead of time at a secret meeting in Sweden in 1973. The meeting was the annual gathering of the Bilderberg Group, a secretive cabal formed by Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands in 1954. The Dutch royal family not only gave its royal imprint to Royal Dutch Petroleum, they are still rumored to be, along with the Rothschilds, one of the largest shareholders in Royal Dutch Shell, from the days when Queen Wilhelmina's Anglo-Dutch Petroleum holdings and other investments made her the world's first female billionaire, right through to today. Bernhard's guest list at the Bilderberg Group reflected his position in the oligarchy. Alongside him at the Swedish conference were David Rockefeller of the Standard Oil Dynasty and his protege Henry Kissinger, Baron Edmund de Rothschild, E.G. Collado, the vice president of Exxon, Sir Dennis Greenhill, director of British Petroleum, and Garrett A. Wagner, president of Bernhard's own Royal Dutch Shell. At the meeting in Sweden, held five months before the oil crisis began, the oligarchs and their political and business allies were planning their response to a monetary crisis that threatened the world dominance of the U.S. dollar. Under the Bretton Woods system, negotiated in the final days of World War II, the U.S. dollar would be the backbone of the world monetary system, convertible to gold at $35 per ounce, with all other currencies pegged to it. Increasing U.S. expenditures in Vietnam and decreasing exports caused Germany, France, and other nations to start demanding gold for their dollars. With the Federal Reserve's official gold holdings plunging and unable to stem the tide of demand, Nixon abandoned Bretton Woods in August 1971, threatening the dollar's position as the world reserve currency. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. As leaked documents from the 1973 Bilderberg meeting show, the oligarchs decided to use their control over the flow of oil to save the American hegemon. Acknowledging that OPEC could completely disorganize and undermine the world monetary system, the Bilderberg attendees prepared for an energy crisis or an increase in energy costs, which, they predicted, could mean an oil price between $10 and $12, a staggering 400% increase from the current price of $3.01 per barrel. Five months later, Bilderberg attendee and Rockefeller protege Henry Kissinger, acting as Nixon's Secretary of State, engineered the Yom Kippur War and provoked OPEC's response an oil embargo of the U.S. and other nations that had supported Israel. On October 16, 1973, OPEC raised oil prices by 70%. At their December meeting, the Shah of Iran demanded and received a further raise to $11.65 a barrel, or 400% of oil's pre-crisis price. When asked by Saudi King Faisal's personal emissary why he had demanded such a bold price increase, he replied, Tell your king... If he wants the answer to this question, he should go to Washington and ask Henry Kissinger. In the second move of the operation, Kissinger helped negotiate a deal with Saudi Arabia. In exchange for U.S. arms and military protection, the Saudis would price all their future oil sales in dollars and recycle those dollars through treasury purchases via Wall Street banks. 
the deal was a bonanza for the oligarchs. Not only did they get to pass the price increases on to the consumers, but they benefited from the huge flows of money into their own banks. The Shah of Iran parked the National Iranian Oil Company's revenues in Rockefeller's own Chase Bank, revenues that reached $14 billion per year in the wake of the oil crisis. With the creation of this new system, the petrodollar, the oligarchs had reached unprecedented levels of control over the economy. Not only that, they had backed the world monetary system with their commodity, oil, and brought potential competition from upstart producer nations under their control all in one step. But for the insatiable appetites of these monopolist titans, mere control over the world's monetary system was not enough. <laughs> 